Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. <clears throat> we have another uh, Jordan Neurosurgery Grand Rounds with Ibrahim Sabea, who's been doing these for a long time, most lately on, on, on Zoom. Uh, and we also have a, a Kahoot quiz at the end of the broadcast, uh, which we will grade and give prizes. So anyways, welcome, Dr. Sabea. It's all yours. Thank you, John, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm going to start sharing the screen. Hmm. Yeah, perfect, okay. perfect. Uh, Good evening or good morning, whatever you are. My name is Abraham Sveh. I'm from Jordan. And uh, this is the place I work in Amman. It's the Farah Medical Campus. And this is the Black Iris, a symbol of Jordan, which I usually put you know, during my lectures. And today we're going to discuss a very unique topic, which is the cervical spinal dumbbell schwannomas or neurofibromas. It's very unique because dumbbell the tumors are are unique. So we'll discuss that from the clinical, radiological, operative, and pathological points of view, as usual. So we're speaking about spinal dumbbell tumors. Some people may not understand what a dumbbell is, especially if they, we have some medical students uh, in the audience. Dumbbell, like dumbbells that we use for uh, weightlifting and so on, it's an hour glass shaped tumors part of it within the spinal canal, part of it outside. So it looks like an hourglass or a dumbbell. So there are three compartments. Spinal compartments within the spinal canal, the canal, foramenal canal, and the paraspinal uh, part. People think of dumbbell tumors as schwannomas. It's not. Only 50% are due to schwannomas and neuronomas, while 50% others are other tumors. And we tend to forget that. We tend to think of dumbbell tumors as just schwannomas. 50% of dumbbell tumors are not schwannomas. So I speak about meningiomas. I had cases of meningiomas presenting like dumbbell tumors, metastasis, gangrene neuroma, chondrosarcoma, giant cell tumor of the bone, osteoma, osteosarcoma, owing. Mangiantelioma, leomyosarcoma, osteoblastoma, and osteoblastoma. So, so many tumors present like numbers simply because they are in the vicinity of the body and the foramen. Some examples of the uh, last case actually, I have a dumbbell tumor. This is uh, chondrosarcoma in the uh, cervical region. And one must not forget that sometimes. The tumors are, you think they are only inside the spinal canal, but you are not aware that they have this silent, what we call silent connection through the foramen. And you don't see that on MRI, especially a low uh, Tesla uh, MRIs. So to speak about schwannomas and the neurofibromas, are this the same? The answer is no. Theodor Schwann, a German pathologist, 1810, 1882, he coined, or the name of Schwann cells were named after him. Schwann cells after Theodore Schwann. And if you look at the, both schwannomas and neurofibromas are equal among males and females. And this is the age group that they come uh, across 25 to 50 years. We come to another pathologist, Friedrich von Ricklenhausen. And the name of NF1 on von Recklenhausen disease is named after this German pathologist, von Recklenhausen disease. So we have three types of neurofibromatosis, but the three of them are due to genetic disorders. NF1, neurofibromatosis type one, NF2, and schwannomatosis. NF1, after which the name neurofibromatosis type 1, von Ricklenhausen disease, it's a genetic disorder at chromosome 17, while NF2 is at chromosome 22. What's the difference? 
يمكن كثير شو نومز عند كثير ذات كنت شو نومز هير إن إن إف تو مostly it is vestibular شو نومز with other tumors إن شوانوماتوزيس it is also at the chromosome twenty two but it is non vestibular شو نومز so إن إف ون إن إف تو and schwannomatosis. Come back to the schwannomas and the neurofibromas. Uh, you have the dorsal root and ventral root. These tumors arise mostly from the dorsal root. Only 5% arise from the motor root. So mostly schwannomas and neurofibromas arise from the sensory root. Other names that you may come across in literature, schwannomas, they were called neuronomas and neuro neurolimomas. These almost are obsolete names now. We stick to schwannomas, but you may come across the neuronomas and the neurolimomas. They are all names for the schwannomas. So schwannomas, they arise from Schwann cells. They are well capsulated. They are extrinsic to the nerve fibers. They are, you can separate them from the nerve. And when they are multiple, as I said, we call them NF2. So here you are. These are uh, uh, nerve fibers here, then this nerve, and this is the schwannomas from Schwann cells. It pushes everything to the periphery and you can actually separate it. So this is the force capsule, which is from the neural tissue around, and this is the true capsule. But you can separate these from the uh, from the uh, nerve. So you have pseudo capsule, you have true capsule. And as I said, in the pseudo capsule, you may find some fascicles. And this is schwannoma, the true capsule uh, within. So this is a schwannoma where you can separate it off the nerve. You can see fascicles, and one of them leaves the tumor from Schwann cells, so it will push everything aside. On the other hand, the neurofibromas, they don't arise from Schwann cells. They arise from fibroblasts. That's why they are called the neurofibromas. So also, they have perineural cells and sometimes some Schwann cells. They are not capsulated in contrast to the schwannomas. Uh, they cannot be separated from the nerve in contrast to the schwannomas, which can be separated. And neurofibromas, when they are multiple, we call them neurofibromatosis type 1 in contrast to the schwannomas NF2. So this is a neurofibroma. You cannot separate it from other uh, nerves or other fascicles. And when you have a plexiform form of this neurofibroma, especially in the face, NF1. So where are they located, these schwannomas and the neurofibromas? Uh, in the cervical region or in others? 75% are within the dura, but extramedullary, which is expected. 15% are totally extradural, and only 15% are dumbbell. And there is this rare type where you'll find schwannoma intramedullary. Some people would say, how, how come? How would you get intramedullary schwannoma? Here you are. This is the axons. And these axons are embedded inside the uh, spinal cord. So when the, uh, uh, when the tumor arises, it will be intramedullary. I looked into literature, only 46 cases in literature were reported of intramedullary schwannomas. And I'm fortunate to have uh, one of those cases I will tell you about it. Uh, the explanation of intramedullary schwannomas that there are axons displaced within the core, like in this case or axons accompanying arteries inside the cord, or you have ectopic Schwann cells. So there is an explanation of why we have intramedullary schwannomas. As I said, I was lucky to have this uh, patient uh, who came to me from Libya, 34-year-old patient with this intramedullary tumor. It's totally intramedullary. I did not think that this is um, a schwannoma at all, but in surgery, it was intramedullary, as you can see, and uh, we removed it completely without any neurosurgical or neurological deficits. And this is the post-operative MRI. And this is the patient himself. <clears throat> so dumbbell schwannomas, they can be lumbar than thoracic and cervical in this order. So they are more lumbar followed by thoracic followed by cervical. 
or they can be at the cranial cervical junction. Let me give you some examples. Again, I choose the examples from my patients. If, I, if you don't see the name here, so most likely I get the uh, example from literature. But once you see this, the name, the age, the uh, gender, so these are my patients. This is lumbar, uh, schwannoma. Another lumbar schwannoma, here you are. It could be thoracic. It could be in the cervical region. Again, this is a patient of mine. Cervical schwannoma, another cervical schwannoma. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Or they can come across the cranial cervical junction. Uh, and this is one patient, my 58 year old female patient. The tumors or neoplasma of Schwann cells are four types. The neurofibroma, which we described, which is mostly from fibroblasts, but they are also arising from Schwann cells. Schwannoma, typically arising from Schwann cells. And we have the, the malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors as the third type of these neoplasms. What about histopathology? And I hope our colleagues, the histopathologists are around. I'll just give a brief introduction and uh, we'll ask them to uh, speak uh, to us about this. So histopathology, if you get a, a neurofibroma schwannoma sent to your histopathologist, uh, he will report spindle cells arranged around blood vessels in pseudo-rosette pattern. So this is blood vessel and the cells, the spindle cells are distributed around it. Another example here of blood vessel and the cells are Spitted around it in pseudo rosette pattern. Again, blood vessel and the cells are arranged around it. So, this is one of the main features of schwannomas. And the other main feature is to see alternating areas of Antony A and Antony B. Uh, again, for uh, junior staff, medical students, or in the audience, Antony A are these spindle cells which are condensed. And to be, they are scarce. So an area of condensed cells and the area with the scarce cells. And to A and to B are sort of alternating. Uh, and this is after Nils Antoni, a Swedish pathologist. And again, the uh, Antoni A and Antoni B zones are named after him. Another name that you came across is Jose uh, Baroque. And these are the rocky bodies that he discovered, which are always associated with uh, Schwannomas, with the Schwann cells. There's even a stamp in his name. He is the Uruguayan Italian pathologist. Uh, the cells are S100 positive, and this is typical of Schwannomas. EMA, epithelium membrane antigen negative, again, because. Uh, I'm not dealing with epithelial tumors. GFAP negative because you're not dealing with uh, glial tumors. P53 is also negative. These are the immune staining that one should do and uh, that we always do in, uh, in our department in, in Jordan, in Amman. Progesterone negative. Synoptophene is negative. Factor. 13 is negative, pancytocarotene is negative. So these immunostaining are essential to do to diagnose the tumor. And also when you do the KI67 index, which uh, shows you the multiplicity of the tumor, usually it's around one sometimes, and in this case, one case of one, it was rather aggressive, and the KI67 was 10%. So that is more towards malignancy. So let's come to the dumbbell spinal schwannomas, which is our topic for tonight. How frequent, how often do we see these cases? I looked into literature, uh, the old and the new. Uh, this 1963 paper by Love and Dodge, published in the spinal cord tumors, they had 1,000 cases of spinal cord tumors, and they had 60 dumbbells. Uh, tumors. So that goes with the frequency that I have alluded to at the beginning. Another paper by Janai, Neurosurgery 2005. 
he had 149 patients, 42 were well number. Again, going with the uh, general frequency in literature. Third paper by Esazona, a surgical strategy for cervical dumbbell tumors, spine 2003, 42 cases, 38 were shown on 38 of dumbbell tumors. So 42 cases of dumbbell tumors, 38 were shown on the previous paper, 149 dumbbell tumors, 42 were dumbbell, 42 were uh, shown on. Nismeti uh, Pamir, my friend from Turkey, uh, reported 82 cases of uh, spinal tumors. He had nine for dumbbell, and in thoracic he had none, and 31 were dumbbell. So this is 82. So the frequency of these cases is very uh, shown in literature. What about the classification? I found the classification is the most awkward. I looked at it carefully and sometimes it is confusing. So you have multiple classifications, but there is a lack of consensus regarding the optimal classification system. Why are we bothering ourselves about the classification system? Because you need to have some regular classification so people would define what approach you have for this time or that time. But let me show you the uh, diversification of the classification in literature, very diversified. There is Eden classification, which is taken as golden standard, standing till now since 1941. Nato and Zong, 2000, Sedar from India, Sedar and Ramunthi in 2001, Asazuma and Toyama in 2004, Jinai and Koyama in 2005. So many classifications. Let me just take you through part of it and you will get confused about which is the best one to follow. Let's take the Eden classification, which is the old one, 1941. Uh, type one is intra and extra dura. So most of the tumor is within the dura, small part of the extra dura. This is rare, 9%. Type two, we have intra for a minute and outside. This is common, 33%. Type three is the same, but it is larger. The foramenal part, the, the uh, paraperitoneal part is larger. And this is the commonest. So this is the commonest type, 53% type three, where you have the paraperitoneal part is larger than the others. And type four, which is rare, it is totally extradural. There is nothing within the spinal canal. It's only in the foramen and outside. So back to this classification, this is the commonest type. Another classification, Yun Tao and Zong, 2000. Uh, they put this uh, illustration showing you the spinal cord and the roots and the dura, the arachnoid coverings and the PA matter coverage. So they call this type one. Type 2A, without involvement of the root. Type 2B, with involvement of the root. 3A, large involvement of the root and coming outside. Type 3B, further extension outside. Type 4, uh, sort of really dumbbell, but in three shapes. So again, if you go back to this, this is confusing. You cannot put your cases uh, according to this classification and it is difficult to remember. Sardar classification, Sardar and Ramamurthy, Ramamurthy from India, back in 2001, type one, type two, type three, Type four, well, you can see that's some invasion of the vertebral body in addition to the foramenal part and the paravertebral part, and it goes through the lamina also. And type five, which is solely within the body of the vertebra. Again, this is difficult uh, one to apply. Type six. Jinai, 
2005, put also as a classification. Group one, strictly within the dura. Group two, intradural and extradural, but still you are in the canal. You did not go out. Group three, extradural within the canal. It is not intradural. Group four, extradural within the canal and out. Group five, intradural canal from it and out. Again, the difference between these five groups is difficult to ascertain, and it is difficult to put your cases according to this classification. Nakamura, 2013, also put his classification, type one. We are still within the spinal canal, part of it within the dura, part of it outside the dura. Type 2A, extra dura, within the canal, and part of it within the foramen. 2B, you are outside the foramen, you are going into the parvatural space. 2C, you are in the foramen, parvatural larger than the one before. Type 3A, intradural, foraminal, and uh, just sitting outside. Type 3B, extending outside. Type 4, going into the vertebra. Type 5, going through the lamina, translaminar. And type 6, it is called multidirectional, going everywhere through the body, the lamina, and the foramen. Again, look at this classification once more. It is difficult to apply. I like the simple uh, classification, and I thereby advocate Nismitin uh, Pamir, my friend from Turkey, a beautiful paper, 2017. Uh, simple uh, thing to apply. He looked at the tumors and he said, it is not enough to say whether it is within the canal or outside. Also, we have to look at the tumor volume and how many levels they are occupying. So uh, Ashwanoma on one level, C34 is different from one which is taking three levels. So the tumor volume, tumor size, the multiple levels of the spine involved is very important. And to me, this is very important uh, advantage of this classification. In addition to the tumor location, whether it is within the canal or outside. So two classification, one regarding the tumor, volume, size, and extension, how many levels? Two centimeters, two to four, more than four centimeters, which means that you have multiple spinal levels, and the location, whether they are intradural, foraminal, or extradural, like this. Type one, type two, you're still within the canal. Type three, just getting out of the canal and type four completely outside the foramen and the combination of these types. I must mention this paper by Atul Gur, uh, my friend from India, 2018, in addition to other papers that Atul published and on this topic, uh, the surgical approaches for C2 neuronomas. And again, he's using the neuronoma terminology, which is now being changed to schwannomas. And he would say that Intraspinal tumor is interdural. So this is the narrow root, which is okay. This narrow root is involved. So the tumor goes like this. So it is interdural, which is very interesting theory. How do these schwannomas present? Obviously, one can tell the presentation, localized pain, reticular pain. You may have sensory deficit, you may have motor weakness, you may have synthetic disturbances. What about management? Basically, we are talking about surgery. Radio surgery and radiotherapy are palliative and given for those cases where you cannot operate. Before we go into the uh, surgery itself, let's just remind ourselves of the anatomy and here we're discussing cervical schwannomas and neuronomas. So let's look at the anatomy of that region. Uh, C1 is atypical cervical vertebra, this is from the top, from below, from the anterior part, and from the posterior part. One has to remember the anatomy there, and you have to remember exactly what is the vertebral foramen. 
uh, in relation to C1 and C2. C2 again from above, from below, from anterior and from lateral with the dendrite process. And the C1, C2 junction or articulation uh, allowing uh, uh, certain movements of the head and so on. So here you are, of typical cervical vertebrae. They are both CF class and axis on top of each other. And this is looking from above, where you can see the C1, the superior articular facet, the doctor process, and the canal. The rest of the vertebrae, C1 and C2, are atypical. They are special, unique vertebrae, and the rest are uh, typical, except maybe for C7 because it is not bifid. All the typical ones are bifid. C7 is not bifid because you are in transition to the thoracic vertebrae. So this is the ancillary process, and this is the frame for the vertebral artery and so on. And this is typical cervical vertebra, as you see it from above, from below, from anterior, and from behind. Again, one has to have this visualization of the vertebrae to be able to operate on that area. The other thing that one has to remember and be careful about is the vertebral artery. Which part you are dealing with? V1, V2, V3, V1 from the subclavian to transverse ramen of C7 or C6. Mostly it is C6, 10% are in C7. V2 from C6 till C2. And V3 from uh, C2 as you go around C1 and then into the uh, inside the dura. And this is V4. So this anatomy must be absolutely mastered for thinking of operating on any dumbbell tumor schwannoma or otherwise. So various views of the vertebral artery from posterior to anterior to lateral. You have to have this X-ray image in your mind whenever you are operating there. Vertebral artery, how do you visualize this if you're looking at the vertebra from anterior? How do you visualize vertebral artery? This is V3 coming from C2, going anterior, lateral, upwards, and then going through foramen of C1 at the back of Atlantic occipital joint and inside the dura. Again, as you see it from the back, this is C2, and you go, this is V3, going anterior, lateral, and then up, and then through the transverse foramen of C1, back of the Atlantic occipital joint inside the dura. And one has to remember what uh, Al Mufti has mentioned in one of his papers about the multiple venous channels around the vertebral artery uh, as it goes between C2 and C1. Horrible veins there. And if you are operating there, you have to prepare yourself for a lot of bleeding and a lot of problems there. And he called this vertebral cavernous sinus, because he resembling this to the carotid artery being surrounded by the cavernous sinus. So also the vertebral artery is surrounded by this uh, mesh and plexus of veins. So this is the relationship of the vertebral artery to the schwannomas. So this is a very intimate relationship and one has to be absolutely careful. Because when the tumor goes through the foramen, the vertebral artery will be pushed, will be narrowed, will be displaced. And again here, this is posterior, this is anterior. As the vertebral artery goes through the transverse foramen, the nerve roots are anterior to it. So vertebral artery is posterior to the nerve root. What about surgical approaches for these tumors? Some rules govern these approaches. If you go for total resection, maybe you'll have morbidity. If you go for subtotal resection, surely you'll have recurrence. So the minimum uh, swings between total resection and its advantages and disadvantages and subtotal resection with its disadvantages. And there's always the question of spinal stability at these junctional areas. So the surgical approaches for dumbbell schwannomas, posterior, anterior, 
anterior lateral or combined. But I have to mention this, that most of the cases are done via posterior approach. You can really reach to any tumor there to any size you like, but sometimes you are forced to use the anterior or anterior lateral or combined. So if you use the posterior approach, the old laminectomy approach, the hemilaminectomy approach, and the semi-hemilaminectomy approach, and this so-called tunnel interlaminal fenestration, and instead of laminectomy or hemilaminectomy, you can do laminotomy or laminoplasty, open door. You may need to do facetectomy and you may do this unilateral partial or bilateral partial or unilateral complete. And you have the question of stabilization using bone graft or instrumentation. General rule of surgery there, debulk the tumor before you start dissecting because uh, it's essential you can see the anatomy better and you can control the bleeding. So here you are, you are shown the uh, vertebrae. And here, this is the dura surrounding the spinal cord, and this is the where the foramen is. So facetectomy has been done there. Again, spinal, dura spinal canal, and this is the uh, schwannoma going through the foramen. So you start with the extra, with the, the outside extradural part, and you debulk it, and then you go to the dura uh, uh, component and remove it. So that part is removed, then you open the dura, you get into the dural part, and then you may find some bleeding here, and you pack it with all sorts of things. Some people, as I said, use the semi hemilaminectomy plus partial facetectomy, like this here, like this here. It's called open tunnel approach. And of course, you have the spinal stabilization, and you need this if you have multiple levels, if it is multidirectional, and if you have done facetectomy. Not just partial facetectomy, but total facetectomy, which is most of the time is needed, especially in large schwannomas. So this is the type of uh, fixation that you do. <clears throat> and you test stability, inflection, and extension. You may go anterior approach, this is rarely needed. If you go anterior approach, then you have to do carbectomy, you have to open the dura, and there is a risk there, but sometimes it is needed. This paper, anterior approach for dumbbell type cervical neurinomas, Iwasaki, uh, they reported four patients. You may need to combine both, and if you do so, once you start with the posterior approach, then you can put a suture around the nerve root and then go from anterior, looking at where you have put the suture and find the nerve root and start from there. And of course, there was the new approach of minimally invasive using these tubes. You can, people reported removing schwannomas using the tubes in minimally invasive fashion. There are some debates here about the surgery for these schwannomas. Debates about should we or should we not be using methylprednisolone as part of the spinal surgery and you are dealing with the spinal cord. Uh, most of the people are dropping this issue now. Still people are using it. Should you be cutting the nerve root from which the schwannoma arises? Some people say no, you don't need. Some people say yes. I am with the people who say yes. You have to cut the nerve root at a safe area where there's no tube, otherwise you will have recurrence. And the other third debate is whether or not you should be using neurophysiological monitoring. So methylprednisolone, as you would see people used to do and use in <coughs> spinal traumas and in intramedullary tumors. And the question, as I said, should we cut the nerve root? Remember that these phenomena, they arise from sensor. And since the roots are compensated by the nearby roots, so there's no problem in cutting a sensor root. It is not affecting the patient in a big way at all. But definitely by cutting the, the nerve root in which the tumor rises, the safety margin decreases the, uh, this is the recurrence. So if you cut, sorry, if you cut the motor root, you will get deficits in 23 cases. 
Why? Because there's some compensation sometimes. But in two cases, there's no compensation. So if you cut C5 root, deltoid muscle will be uh, paralyzed. If you cut C8 root motor, then you will have intrinsic muscle paralysis. So these two roots are important to preserve, either by removing the tumor completely, uh, or if you need to transect the, the, the uh, motor root, then accept the sequences. And if you, uh, as I said, affect the, the, cut the sensor in the root, then you may get the innervation symptoms, but in not a majority of cases. What about electrophysiological enhancement? Should we be doing this routinely or is it depending upon the case? Authors again here differ. Some people would not use it in neurophysiological monitoring. Some people would use it. I use it in certain cases, not in every case. Uh, and this is important when you are sacrificing a nerve root. So it is useful if you have multiple nerve roots coming and adhering to the tumor. So which nerve root to cut? Neuromonitoring will tell you. Uh, people say it is not useful because most of the roots are sensory, so I don't bother. What kind of intraoperative in neurophysiological monitoring? Sensory evoked responses, motor evoked responses, and EMG. And of course, EMG and nerve conduction studies. <clears throat> so this is cervical, but mainly it is SAP and MEP. And thoracic, SAP, MEP, and lumbar, it is must yet to use EMG and nerve conduction in your physiological monitoring. So you look at these, SAP, MEP, and you look at 50% reduction in the amplitude or 10% increased latency, this usually denotes nerve injury. What about surgical outcomes? Is it good to deal with these cervical dumbbell neurons? Let's look at the literature. This beautiful paper, 2006, Nakamura, long-term surgical outcomes of cervical dumbbell neuromas. He could achieve 76 total resection. Anybody who tell you I achieved 100% total resection in all my cases is lying. So sometimes you have to accept defeat and leave some tumor to save the neurological function. And you use the McCormick uh, grading preoperative and postoperative to see whether they have changed, improved, got worse, or patient uh, died, mortality, and so on. What about recurrence? What are the cases that we see recurrence in most of these cases? Increased number, the more number of vertebral bodies, the more injury, and the more residual, and the more recurrence. Cranial caudal length, which I alluded to, the length. Uh, large tumor size, you will get recurrence. If you do subtotal resection, you will get recurrence. Sometimes in malignant test pathology, you will get recurrence. And once you get the KI67, then uh, you would actually uh, high grade this malignancy. Because usually it is one to two in the normal uh, uh, tumors, the benign tumors. And if you don't resect the affected roots, you may get recurrence. Complications, of course, like any surgery, sepsis, bleeding, etc. The famous ones are CSF leak, pseudomeningocele, kyphosis, scoliosis. You get sensory denervation symptoms, you get motor, and you get recurrence, and you need to reoperate. So these are examples of the complications, uh, pseudomeningocele and CSF leak. And this is an example of the kyphosis and scoliosis seen after this kind of surgery. My personal experience, I presented to you between 1990 and 2020, 30 years. And out of 389 intradural tumors, I faced 38 tumors. Mostly they were dumbbell schwannomas. I had chordomas, I had too many tumors, but most of these cases of dumbbell tumors were schwannomas. I uh, present some of these cases. First case is a uh, dumbbell schwannoma C1, C2. You can see there, C1, C2. And you can see that it is within the, the canal, within the foramen, and going to the paravertebral area. This is a 50-year-old male patient. 
and this is the tumor. You have to do CT angio there to see the vertebral artery. And you have to check the stability before and after. And this is post-operative when the tumor was removed completely. This is where the tumor was, the cavity. And this is the patient himself after surgery. Another case of C1, C2, dumbbell neurofibroma, a young lady of 38 who presented with this occipital and shoulder pain. Occipital pain, you should be suspicious of higher cervical forming magnum lesions. So only because she developed weakness and clonus with the positive Hoffman and Lermit positive that people did MRI and found this large tumor. So it is really compressing the cranial junction and extending through the foramen into the part of the tubular area. A huge tumor, large size is important. And this is the post -op. where the tumor was removed without need for any fixation. So these are the post-op and follow-up of this patient. And that's the patient herself. A case of C5, C6, C6, 7 here, we have multiple limbs, and this is an important case to present. So you can see here, C4, C5, C6, C7, so it is occupying this uh, junctions, uh, C5, C6, C6, C7. Again, this is the cut at C6, 5 here, 6 here, C6, 7 is here, so it's multiple levels and multiple spinal roots affected. You can see the uh, changes within the bone, and you can see the vertebral arterial movement. And look at here. It is pushed and it is narrowed. You don't see any vertebral uh, canal here. Again, you must do the CT angle to see what is the vertebral artery in all of this. You can see it's eating the bone. Here you are, eating the bone, C5, 6, and C6, 7. C5, 6, C6, 7. This is the view, and then the canal. And this is the oblique view, which is important. People now tend to forget about these oblique views, how important and how informative they are, where you can see the enlargement of the inter- uh, vertebral foramen. You can see it here. Let me show you the um, first part of surgery because it is multiple levels and because of the bony erosion. Uh, we will show you the first part where we started with the uh, fixation part of the lesion in the spine. So if you find any instability or if you expect any instability, you would start by stabilization, and then followed by the uh, surgery from posterior or whatever uh, approach you want to do. So my routine is to stabilize before. If you, if you have any instability, if the spine is degenerative, and if you are going to do facetectomy, if it is multiple levels, then you start with this step first. The second part, of course, this is post-operative after the fixation. Uh, and now we'll start the surgery, second part for the removal of the tumor. We record our cases in 3D. Now I'll change it into 2D. So as, as, as I said, we start with the, uh, the foraminal part or the part of the foraminal part, not the dural part. Here we're using the ultrasonic aspirator. And I meant to show you some of this clips from the surgery to show you the amount of bleeding that really vascular tumors 
they are in direct touch with the vertebral arteries, so they get the blood supply from there. I'm using here the ultrasonic aspirator to debulk the tumor, to stay within the capsule. But in spite of this, still you will find uh, lots of bleeding. Here I'm separating the edge of the tumor from the edge of the dura. This is here the foramen. Facetectomy has been done. So it has been done by the tumor. So sometimes you need to do more drilling uh, to see the tumor. But the facetectomy has been done by the tumor and it was unstable as well. So here you are taking this tumor outside the dural sac. And here, once you go into this space, you'll have lots and lots of bleeding. And I did leave this bleeding to show you the amount of bleeding that one can actually face during uh, this kind of surgery. Here we are completing the resection of the tumor. And then you face this kind of bleeding from the muscular branch of the vertebral artery. Being prepared for such an incident, uh, you will pass through and here you're separating the tumor from the extradural space here. This is the nerve root from which it arises. Having debulked the tumor, I open the dura and then remove the intradural part and then continue for the rest of the tumor. But I do debulking first as a very initial step. Here I'm pushing the tumor, which is inside the dura through the hole that it made for itself to the outside so that I can resect it completely. Again, having done that, I went back and cut the nerve root from which it arises there. You'll find another nerve root here. There it is. So you can see the hole here through which the tumor is passing from intradural to extradural foramenal and paravertebral. Again, pushing, this is the hole, pushing that part outside. This one must be closed. I close it with muscle graft and suture. It's not enough to put muscle graft. You have to put the suture around it. And then continue for the rest of the tumor. Close the dura. I usually close it in continuous silk suture because if you need to go back again for any reason, uh, black sutures, black silk sutures will guide you. Here's the rest of the tumor. We are going through the foramen outside and pursuing the last drop of the tumor. I don't want any recurrence at all. Again, separating it from the extracapsular area here will cause a lot of bleeding. You are working in a very dangerous area. The vertebral artery is at risk. But if you know your anatomy and where to find the vertebral artery, then there's no problem. Some people put uh, flu seal or uh, dural sealant. I don't like. I like to see the bleeding and I like to stop it. Uh, it is only in very rare cases that I use the flu seal or dural sealant to stop the bleeding. Here, you can see that we are separating it from the vertebral artery but still lots of branches getting lots of light to the tumor. It has to be controlled. So here we are, uh, this is here another branch for the tumor. Now we'll come across this bleeding again. I really, uh, in purpose, put this uh, use People think that this is straightforward cases. They are not, they are difficult cases. They are challenging cases. They need mastering of the anatomy there and mastering with microscopic techniques. So the vertebral artery is just here. Now I'll show you its pulsations. You can see there, 
defensive procedure. So this extra neuron part has been removed, the neuron has been closed, then you tag this with muscle and gel form and the neuron sealed. So this is the post up. Having done the fixation as first part and then uh, did the removal of the chamber. And this is where we were, and this is the fixation. And this is the patient herself. Not long follow up. Another case of C3, C4 schwannomas. A uh, young Jordanian lady, lady uh, came with this tumor, C3, 4. She had lots of degenerative changes and she had disc disease, degenerative disc disease, and she had body changes and she had some instability in addition to this uh, tumor, which is intradural extra and extra paravertebral. So you can see it going there and it is in relation with the vertebral artery. This is the main issue in these dumbbell tumors. Again, see how the foramen is widening. You can see the vertebral artery in its foramen here, you don't see it. Same thing here, you don't see it here. Again, the amount of damage that this tumor cause staying there for a long time. And the CD injury showing you the vertebral artery being narrowed there uh, against the tumor pressure. So again, the oblique view will show you the widened intervertebral foramen. It is unstable spine beforehand. So she must go for fixation, which was done as a first step before going for the tumor. And we now will go for the surgery of the tumor itself. Again, it is the same principle, but the different uh, cuts and different uh, videos. Here I'm using the drill to, uh, as I said, the tumor has done the facetectomy itself, but you complete the facetectomy to give yourself a better view. This is the dural sac here, this is the tumor. Yeah, yeah. And you start with this using the ultrasonic aspirator. And again, all the time you'll face the bleeding, having done decomposition, opening the dura, get the interdural part, the tumor, and here I'm cutting the nerve This is the, where the tumor arise from this nerve root. So you cut it without any hesitation. It's a sensory root, as you can see, it is in the back side of the spinal cord. So this is the nerve root being cut and the tumor being removed. You do this and then you go back and then close this opening here, and then the dura. This is the nerve root from which it arises, it's being cut off. So I am with the idea of cutting the nerve root from which these tumors arise. Back to the extra spinal canal. Again here, removing the tumor, facing the same thing, the bleeding. Again, coming from the vertebral artery, which is just here, as you can see. So it's been preserved. You pack here and you close here and that's it. Here again, you put a small muscle plug and you suture it for suturing the dura. So the same principle is presenting to you in various patients. This is the post up. Remember that we have done fixation beforehand because she had instability uh, of the tumor, and this is the follow up. This is where the tumor was, sorry. This is the cavity where the tumor was, there and there. Again, no tumor. This is where the tumor was. So 
and the cord and the cavity where the tumor was. And this is the patient itself. Another case of C3, C4 uh, schwannoma in this patient. Young patient from Kurdistan, Iraq, 16 year old. Again, same principles, widening the intervertebral frame and going outside. You can see the vertebral artery here, you don't see it here. Again, vertebral artery being narrowed there compared to this side. We know that the left vertebral is dominant, but in this case, this non-dominant vertebral artery uh, is the left side and the right side is, is narrowed. Amount of bony destruction it causes. And the fixation that we've done as a first step of dealing with these cases. So I'll we'll show you the video. Following the same routine, dealing with the paravertebral or the foraminal part first, leaving this last using the ultrasonic aspirator, taking the tumor there. And here we can show the hole through which the tumor went through. So this is the hole within the dura at the site of the origin of these tumors. <clears throat> so here you are, we are cutting the nerve roots. So again, the same routine, muscle plug or fat plug with surgical and, and duracell and so on. Okay, we'll finish with that. This young man done very well, has been being stabilized and his tumor removed, and he's been followed for about seven years now. He's doing well, he's growing well, he's going to the university. Another case of C1, C2, Schwannoma, in this 58 year old patient with quadriparesis and pyramidal signs. Again, you can see and appreciate the tumor going through the foramen. The CT angiogram to show the vertebral artery and the surgery itself. And this is the last one, I'll be finished in about one minute. Just to show you this interesting case and the relationship of the vertebral artery, which you can see here, and the venous plexus, the so-called the vertebral cavernous sinus. This is the nerve root. It's been cut at a safety margin. The vertebral artery has been mobilized. And once you start to move the tumor, you will have lots of bleeding coming from these plexus of veins. Opening the dura, getting the interdural part with the color of the dura around it. These are rootlets here, dorsal rootlets. But you have mobilized the artery here, the vertebral artery is here. You have mobilized it completely. And now we'll come to the nerve roots where the schwannoma did arise. And without any hesitation, you cut that nerve root. C2 nerve root is not much of any deficit for the patient. It's compensated by the others. But here they don't risk you any uh, recurrence. 
Having done that, you have to patch the neuron. You can see here the uh, spinal accessory going up. You can see the vertebral artery here. V4 is here. And you can see it's the extra dura part. So this is the vertebral part outside the dura, and this is inside the dura. And the tumor is there. You do dura patch and dura seal and so on. So this is post-operative MRI without any complications and a long follow-up. And the patient, this is her first day, and she was so happy that when she, she came, she was quite hyperitic. She could not stand. Now she can, and that is the merits of this kind of surgery. With this, I finish. In conclusion, dumbbell genomas of dumbbell tumors in general are challenging lesions because they lie in two or more anatomical areas. And the surgical objective is to do neural decompression, radical excision if you can, but with the preservation of spinal stability and minimizing any tissue damage. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take your questions and comments. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabaya. Uh, and the floor is open for comments. Uh, I guess I have a see, comment. Yeah, I see Dr. Abafarsa, our uh, pathologist. Uh, do you want to comment on these uh, schwannomas, Hassan? Yes. Yes, actually, the second case that Dr. Brahim Speh presented, she's a friend of mine, and she called me uh, about six years ago uh, for one of the Gulf states, and she visited several neurosurgeons there, and they told her this is very, very difficult surgery, and uh, you no, nobody can operate on this case. You have to have danger of paralysis or phrenic nerve damage, and she was afraid, and then she called me from uh, one of these Gulf states, and I told her, don't worry, uh, Dr. Rahim Speh is really very capable of doing these uh, surgeries and she has dumbbell tumor and she came in and she did extremely well. I'm following her up. And actually I, I called her uh, several weeks ago and she is doing very, very, very well. So what, what, what is very difficult in, in some areas by, dif by different surgeons, maybe it's not difficult uh, in the hands of Dr. Brahim Spe. And this is a, a, cert a certificate that I can certify uh, from my own experience with Dr. Brahim on this case. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Can you make any comments about Antony A, Antony B value and so uh, on? Actually, these tumors, uh, it's, uh, the main differential in morphology is uh, 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 schwannoma, neurofibroma, and meningioma. And uh, we do several stains to uh, and to, co to uh, separate them uh, from each other. Uh, the schwannoma, usually they have Antony A, Antony B, neurofibroma, usually they don't have it. Schwannoma usually are well circumscribed and the recurrence rate is really low compared to neurofibroma. Uh, factor 13X, uh, 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 one of the factors that differentiate between schwannoma and the neurofibroma. The other one is uh, meningioma. Meningioma, we usually, I usually do multiple immune staining so to separate both of these uh, 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 entities because the management is different. Uh, if you call it in meningioma, usually you have to uh, so go also after the bone. If you call it uh, schwannoma, probably they don't go after the bone, the neurosurgeons. Uh, I, I usually do multiple immune staining, not only one to uh, confirm my diagnosis, I do multiple, so it, the, the diagnosis, the final diagnosis will be really accurate, whether it is neurofibroma, schwannoma, or uh, meningioma. So what about these uh, Verroquet buddies? These Verroquet buddies, uh, they are actually uh, uh, part of the histological feature that's seen in Schwannoma. And when we, we, don't, we don't see them very often. We see them in about uh, 20 to 30 percent of Schwannomas. And when you see them, it's really very good uh, mark that this is a Schwannoma, not a neurofibroma, and not a, uh, a meningioma. Yeah. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Yes. Go ahead, Saeed, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Jean Benit, for all this effort. And thank you very much, Professor Ibrahim Sbeh, for this very nice uh, lecture. 
Thank you. And for all these, uh, congratulations for all these uh, webinars you presented. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know why sensory nerve motor are affected more than motor's nerve. I don't know why. Nobody have, knows why. <laughs> Nobody knows why. We, ha we have this phenomenon also in intracranial uh, compartment, like for uh, yes. uh, trigeminal neur yes. neuron. Yes, vestibular neuron, etc. Et yeah. Uh, do you have experience with the L4, L5 neurinomas? Because uh, there is. Uh, yes, yes. I, I have a number of cases, I have oh, thoracic cases, important. but the topic for tonight is cervical schwannomas, so I presented the cervical ones. But yes, I have lumbar and I have thoracic ones. Uh, did you have a motor deficit uh, during post-operative period or not for Yeah, you time? have to tell the patient, you have to tell the patient that sensory or motor deficit is affected. You are dealing with four from nerve roots or five nerve roots, etc., etc. So you have to warn the patient either you leave a part of the tumor and uh, risk recurrence or you would accept this deficit being motor or sensory in case you remove or cut the nerve roots. I always tell the patient to accept that risk. Uh, you use uh, obviously uh, intraoperative neuromonitor for absolutely okay. yes thank you thank you okay more comments uh, questions the harsha i guess i had to leave okay dr sabaya uh, i guess we'll go on to the kahoot 10 sure. questions 10 questions that you made up from your presentation. Absolutely. Okay, so let me screen share this. And I'm putting the, I'm putting the, uh, the links. Uh, you basically vote with your smartphone and you go to the kahoot.it, www.kahoot.it. Let me, let me screen share that, matter of fact. Okay, let me screen share this. It takes a little bit to set up. Okay, here's the information that you need. Uh, go to, on your smartphone, go to www.kahoot.it and you put the game pin in on your smartphone. It'll last you for a pin. It's this one particular to this webcast is 971-5928. <clears throat> It'll take a while to get a couple people in here. Okay. Just so, once again on your smartphone, go to www.kahoot.it. Okay, and that next screen, it'll ask you for a pin. You punch in 971-5928. Just says the other three uh, associates here on the screen. Okay, I think, well, I think we'll start Dr. Sure. Sabea yeah. and the other yeah. people will join. Sure. Okay, now the question is gonna come up and you can answer by the color, uh, the color of the answer. So you, okay, here we go. <coughs> okay, schwannomas constitute what percentage of dumbbell spinal tumors? Okay, just pick the color on your smartphone, red, blue, or, or yellow. OK, 
Okay. Okay, uh, three of them were correct. And uh, that's a good start. Well, 50% uh, of the dumbbell spinal tumors are shown. So oh, okay, not, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Everyone missed that one. <laughs> right, so oh, it's okay. not 20%, it's not 90%, it's just half of these cases. Uh, that are uh, really uh, due to schwannomas. They are dumbbell and they are due to schwannomas. The other 50 uh, percent are schwannomas and uh, other tumors, especially from the bone, chondroma, chondrosarcoma, osteoma, osteosarcoma, and so on and so forth. So 50 percent okay. of the dumbbell spinal tumors are schwannomas. Okay, very good. Okay, next question, the same thing. Uh, and they actually rank people. Uh, well, I guess no one got it right, so no one's in the lead. Yeah. Okay, dumbbell schwannomas constitute what percentage of all spinal schwannomas? So we have spinal schwannomas, either intradural or foraminal or outside the, the, the dural sac. How many of these schwannomas of the spine are really dumbbell? Okay, A, and that's uh, that's not the correct answer, right? The Dr. correct answer is 15%. 15. So spinal, uh, dumbbell spinal schwannomas constitute 15% of all spinal schwannomas. Relatively low. Uh, okay, very good. Go on to the next question. Sure. Okay, we got a lead here. Someone's got the right one, okay. Okay, next question. Regarding neurofibroma, which of the following statements is false? Okay, they are easily separated from the nerve they arise from. This That's is the, this is the false one because they are not easily separable. They are, you cannot separate them from the nerve. This is the difference between neurofibroma and the schwannoma. Schwannoma, you can separate it from the rest of the inner roots or fascicles, while neurofibroma, it is stuck together because it arises from the neurofibroblasts, uh, from fibrous tissue within this uh, fascicles. So you cannot separate it from other fascicles of the nerve. So the false statement about neurofibroma that they are is it separable? They are not. Very good. Okay, next question. Okay, there's a ranking, a change in the ranking. Charming Bobcats heading it. Okay, and it neuroanatomy V2 segment of vertebral arteries and is in which of the following? Okay, the correct answer is... The correct answer is that it is from C2 till uh, C6. This is the correct answer. C2 to C6. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, the next one. <clears throat> Schwannomas arise mainly from... People answer that pretty quickly. Yeah. I think they got that one right. Okay. Posterior roots is the correct answer. Is posterior rootlets is the correct one, huh? Yes, it is the sensitive root, yes. Okay, very good. The cervical transverse foramen. The vertebral artery is in what relation to the nerve root? So what is the relationship between the vertebral artery and the nerve root in the uh, cervical vertebrae? Okay. Correct answer. Okay. It is anterior to the root, yes. Okay. The, the, people are getting smarter. Paul Ryan. <laughs> 
In cervical dumbbell schwannoma surgery, the least appropriate neurophysiological monitoring is. Is it sensory local responses? Is it motor local responses? Or is it the uh, EMG and others? Okay, EMG is the correct answer. It's the, it's the least appropriate. You use mm -hmm. EMG more in the lumbar area. Right, the least appropriate, not the most. Yes. Okay. Sacrifice an anterior root of C8 will result in which of the following? Can we, can we sacrifice C8 roots or not? No appreciable deficits or just weakness of the extension of the wrist or weakness of the intrinsic muscles of the hand? Hey, what? Oh, Correct everyone got that right. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. They're listening, Dr. Sabaya. And that's the, that's the idea. Now we're hey, talking about Anthony A and Anthony B A's zones. Zone. Anthony A zone in particular. One of these statements is false. Okay, the correct answer. Is that the correct yes. answer? Yeah, the correct answer. Anthony, okay. uh, we are talking about a fourth system, about Anthony A. And because Anthony A is a very cellular area, it is highly cellular. Area. So if we say Anthony A is a scanty cellular, is a false statement. Okay, very good. The last question, which of the following statements Statement is correct about multiple schwannomas. Is it NF1, is it NF2, or is it malignant? Everyone answered. Okay, is that the correct answer? That's the correct yes. answer. Okay, the so majority, majority got it. That's ending on a good note. Now here's the final scores. So we get going number three. Charming Bobcat number two. Nice. And the, the high score goes to. Uh, no, I don't know what it went to. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Don't you worry. Uh, Don't you worry. Man, I, I just put the next next screen. So <laughs> Unfortunately, okay, very good. Uh, that was good, Dr. Sabaya, to go into yeah, ar areas that you want to kind of highlight. Sure. So, okay, do you have a topic uh, for yes. a couple, couple uh, of weeks? Um, next time, in two weeks' time, uh, we'll uh, be presenting the Falco Tintorial meningiomas, a very unique subtype of meningiomas. Meningioma can occur anywhere, convexity or skull base, paraspinal, parasagittal, paracelsine, uh, para, uh, but a very unique place is the falco tintura junction of the folks with the tent. This is a very difficult situation, and we'll discuss the intricacies, the intricacies of this kind of tumor, falco tintorial meningiomas. Very good. Okay, we look forward to that, and thank you for all the panel for coming. Thank you very much. Okay.